thank you, Claire. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. It's a, a joint presentation, as, as Claire said. It's uh, myself and Annette. Um, when I proposed coming up here to dive the Sophia, uh, Annette had offered many years ago, you know, come on up, you've got to dive the shipwreck. And uh, I do a lot of shipwreck work in, in British Columbia. Um, I've been diving since 1977. Um, so my original offer was, you know, I can talk on my book, Ship China. And, uh, and Annette talked to the museum and the museum thought that was good. And then they sort of went, well, hmm, they pondered for a bit and said, you know, we have, the, it's the opening of the Princess Sophia shipwreck exhibit. And so what can you do on the Princess Sophia? And I said, well, I can tell you all about the China, uh, but Annette's really the, uh, the expert on the shipwreck and, and the events uh, surrounding it and diving it. So I said, you know, maybe uh, the best thing to do is I'll start off by introducing the ship. So I'll, I'll introduce the Princess Sophia to you, give you a little bit of uh, information about her. So many people talk about the wreck and the wreck only, but you want to sort of understand that little ship before her wrecking event. And so I'm going to lead off by doing that. Annette will then chime in in terms of its uh, loss. And then uh, she will also share some video with you of, of what it looks like today. And then I'm going to harp back to the, the ship China theme. And uh, she's quite incredible in that for a little ship of 245 feet, she had 15 different patterns of ship china. And I can, <laughs> I can tell you that there's many much larger vessels and you find two, maybe three patterns. So we're gonna share that with you this evening. Okay, so just a little bit about her. She was built for the Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, they operated uh, basically a sub company uh, called the BC Coast Steamship Service. And she was purposely built for the North Coast run. So by that is they had in mind that it's going to be a longer trip and they had to provide the necessities of, of, of taking care of passengers for you know, a four day run to the north. She also operated a little bit on, on BC's, uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. She was built of steel. Uh, she was 245 feet long, so not a, a super large vessel. Uh, but what's quite interesting is she was called a pocket liner. And so people say, well, what's a pocket liner? Well, it meant that she basically had all the amenities of the great liners of the Atlantic, but shrunk, so sort of uh, shrunk down. And that is that she had you know, food capacity, she had state rooms, she had, uh, she had uh, um, you know, uh, smoking room, she had observation lounges, she had everything, but just on a smaller scale. Now, she had a licensed passenger capacity of 500 people, and I remember Annette sort of saying to me, she said, what, 500 people? I mean, how would you get 500? Well, that was her licensed day uh, capacity. So if she was just traveling between something like Victoria and Vancouver, uh, she could carry up to 500 people. So that's her maximum capacity. It didn't mean she could accommodate that many people. But she did have 83 staterooms with 166 berths. And she had an additional room in those days, there was class distinctions. So she had an additional room for 84 people in second class. So you know, kind of like today when you get on the plane, you can be in first class, business class, or with the rest of us in the back of the plane. <laughs> so, uh, but as I said earlier, she was equipped with all the necessities, necessities to feed and entertain people for the long run from Victoria, Vancouver to Skagway was her principal run. Okay, so when she was built, uh, she first arrived in Victoria, BC on May 21st, 1912. And the principal paper of the day and even today in Victoria is the Daily Colonist. It's now called the Times Colonist. And in those days, every marine event was reported, so in great detail. So what we learn from the paper is we want to know a little bit about her is they reported on the forward deck is a finely built appointed observation room. So that was a place you could go observe the landscape as you travel along much like this, you know, the cruise ships today. They usually have a observation lounge in the upper part of the, the vessel so you can look at the scenery as you go by. So that's really, uh, she had a small observation lounge. Um, they reported that she had a smoking room set by itself in a deck house on the upper deck aft 
is excellently and comfortably appointed. And we'll show you pictures of that shortly. So in other words, you could smoke in comfort in those days. <laughs> uh, they also said forward is a spacious social hall with a piano and there were state rooms handsomely finished on either side. And so we'll actually get a sense of that as well. So upper part of this vessel, you had this observation room. Below that, you had this social hall. So it was a place where people gathered. There was a piano, there was concerts, there was all sorts of stuff. And then finally, she had a dining room. And uh, there's various uh, reports that said the dining room. Some have said 103 people, others have said 112 people. Um, she may have been uh, refitted a little bit to, to increase her capacity, but it was finished in mahogany and maple panels, which is pretty typical of CPR liners of the day that are well appointed with wooden paneling inside. So just to look at the vessel a little more, this is another uh, side profile of her, and we're just going to talk a little bit about what's on each deck, so you get a feeling of, of, of how she was laid out. So on the upper deck, or boat deck, and it got its name by the fact that where are all the lifeboats? It's a boat deck, okay? So it starts off with a wheelhouse up front. Behind that is a chart room, so that's where they did all the charting for navigation, and there were some probably first-class staterooms on that level. Next, you get what they call the promenade deck, so that's the next level, and that's the forward part of that was that observation lounge, and the aft part was that set-aside smoking room. Then below that, we have the awning deck, uh, and it gets its name because it's kind of enclosed, and it has the social hall forward, the dining hall, and pantry aft. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the dining room in a minute. Uh, and then finally you get to that main deck, which is the deck just above the water level, so where you see those open doors on the side of the ship, and that was where the second class accommodation was, that's where the crew accommodation was, and then below that you're getting into the engine room and the boilers. Okay, so just a few onboard views, there's very few views of her available, so I mean, uh, if you Google the internet, you'll find some of these images, uh, some are probably not, uh, you know, in some museums, uh, they may have images that have yet to be digitized, so we don't even know they exist. Uh, in this case, the stateroom is actually uh, uh, an image from a stateroom in the Princess Louise, uh, another CPR vessel, but very similar. Uh, the stateroom image that you do find of the Princess Sophia, very much like this, but is usually so badly corrupted and, and, uh, and faded, it's, it's hard to make out uh, the accoutrements. So the promenade deck is where that's, that little uh, smoking room is, and that's in fact the smoking room. You can see the lifeboats on top. The awning deck, this is just the main hallway down either side of the ship. And then here's that smoking room they keep talking about. So you get a sense, you know, it's uh, paneled in wood, comfortable chairs, people sitting back with their pipes and their cigars and all manner of, uh, of smoking devices. Now, they didn't have video games, they didn't have TV. <laughs> so the entertainment was simplistic, but it was available to, very much like today, to, to occupy you, you know, as you, you know, you're sailing for four days, you can't just sit and read a book all four days. So they had things like, you know, potato sack racing. And uh, they had things like ring toss was a popular one. You know, it's uh, pretty old fashioned. And even today, Go climb on the Hall and America Line ship. On the top deck, you can pay, play shuffleboard. So it hasn't gone away. It's just maybe a little old fashioned. And then of course, there were lots of card games. You hear about bridge tournaments and, and bridge games. So there was entertainment. It was just a simpler form of, of what we know today. So, and to give you a sense of, of, of you know, just what occurred, they actually had concerts. They had singers, they had uh, people playing the piano. So, uh, you know, people were singing and dancing and having a good time at, at, at different times on board the vessel. Um, so this, again, is, is the piano shot is taken, I think, from the Princess Louise, uh, because there isn't one available of, of the uh, Sophia, but that's essentially what you would have found in that uh, forward uh, lounge. Okay, so my specialty. And 
what I like to get across is you're talking 1918. Well, let me tell you, they knew how to do things. Think of the five-star hotels today. You eat off white china and stainless steel. This would have been a representative setting on the Princess Sophia. And, you know, you dined in luxury. Like, if you were a commoner, you went on board this vessel, you were all now elevated to first class because there wasn't really a class distinction when you went to the dining room. Okay, so you, you dined on top mark china, silver plate, you know, silver plated cutlery, uh, crested glassware, flowers on the table, and crisp white linen. Okay, so that was just day to day. This particular pattern, and we'll see it uh, occur quite frequently, was a pattern called Tremblant China introduced by the BC Coast Service in 1910. Okay, so it had been introduced in 1910 and most of the vessels were equipped to it. But we're going to talk about that topic in much more detail. So just again, to give you a sense, the dining room was in the aft part of the vessel, uh, just above the water line, so that awning deck. And there's a reason for that. When you travel in most cruise ships today, where is the dining room? It's in the stern down by the water. And why is that? That's where the less movement is in the vessel. You don't want it on the top deck bouncing up and down and rolling back and forth, right? So you imagine an 11-story cruise ship and you're dining on the top deck in rough seas. It'd be a bit of a mess. So they knew about that, and especially a small ship, the lower the center of gravity, the better. Um, I mentioned earlier capacity 112 people. So you're going, if we think about when she sailed, from Skagway, she had 344 people on board. Uh, hang on, how is 344 going to fit into 112? They used to sit people by, you were issued a card that gave you your dining time. The cruise ships still do that. Most of them are two, two seatings, right? So in this case, they probably had three seatings. So somebody would get breakfast at 7 in the morning, somebody got at 8 in the morning, somebody got at 9, right? That's how they were able to accommodate the, the number of people. And again, it was uh, you know, all finished in wood, and uh, the tables would have been more bench tables. But they ate well. Okay, you may not like the menu or all the things on the menu because they did we eat some weird things back then. But you look at that, and again, remember, this is a small vessel, and look at your choices, right? And remember, this wasn't a buffet. This wasn't a cafeteria. You were served on that china and silver on white linen, and you had this choice of menu on that little vessel. So I'm just trying to give you a sense that it was somewhat elegant. It might have been simpler times, but you know, in some ways it was fancier times. So that's my initiation, so you know a little bit about the ship, what she would have felt like, and that's now going to share with you, you know, what became of her. Thank you. So just just a thought. I, I remember on the Alaska Marine Highways when we dined on white tablecloths yeah. with silver and glassware. So, um, yeah, it was, pretty, it was pretty awesome. So the Princess Sophia left Skagway at um, 11 p.m. That was four hours after her scheduled departure date. She was late um, getting into Skagway for her final trip um, because she actually stopped and helped another ship that was in trouble. So, um, so she uh, she started heading south. She was full of people that were happy. They were leaving. Um, they were leaving the north for the winter for the winter and going to home and being with families. And um, for those of you, I'm sure most of you have heard of the Sophia. There's a lot of controversy about her. Um, and this is this is actually where one of the controversies begin. If you look at this, um, at this photo, um, you'll, it is it, said in many books and many writings that she could have, when, after she hit the reef, she could have um, got people off. There were ships that came by to help. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm a, I'm a boat captain, so I look at things a little bit differently. Um, and I look at this picture and one of the first things that I see is, what direction is the wind? Can you tell? Do you see the reef? 
Can you see the reef where she's aground? What direction is the wind? What direction are the waves? Um, if you, if you, um, um, if you were the captain, and if you look at this picture, and you lowered that life raft, where do you think it would go with all with your passengers on board? So the captain, uh, the captain is, knew his boat was solid on the reef. She wasn't going anywhere. She's double hulled which is unusual for boats of that time. So she's strong. Um, she's been on reefs before and, um, and floated free. So as a captain, what would you do? You would make your passengers comfortable. You would serve dinner. You would have entertainment. And you would make life as normal as possible while you were sitting on the reef. Um, you'll um, <clears throat> see there in the lower corner, there was an individual on board whose name was John Pugh, who's not related to the John Pugh that we all know. But he wasn't worried. He, uh, he um, you know, he, he wrote, uh, she's high and dry on Vanderbilt Reef, perfectly safe and happy. But keep in mind that Mr. Pugh survived the wreck of the state of California down in Gambier Bay on August 17, 1913. So he's an experienced shipwreck survivor. The weather, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, will not let Sophia off the reef. But Captain Locke was not worried, as you can see by his, um, his radiogram. We'll get, we'll get them off tomorrow. It's not a big deal. But one of the passengers didn't quite see things the way everybody else saw things. He did not feel quite as safe and secure as everyone else. He wrote out his last will and testament and wrote a letter to his, um, to his fiance and, uh, and laid out where his, his uh, assets, how they were to be distributed. So he wasn't as comfortable as some of the other folks. So this, this photo of the Sophia, when it was taken um, on October 25th, she had less than seven hours to live. And the ferocity of the seas and the winds were beginning, by this time, were beginning to take their toll on the Sophia. Still, the passengers were not panicked, as the captain, pap, captain said. Uh, um, the disposition of the passengers were normal. They had some problems, but uh, they managed to uh, um, figure them out. And they had rescue boats standing by. So, so people were, you know, they were OK. But it was beginning to take its toll on the ship. And then darkness came, and things were not all right anymore. And by 5.20 PM, things were getting desperate. And as you can see in this message, um, at 5.20 PM, um, the, uh, the radio operator um, radioed back to the cedar all right, but for God's sakes, hurry. Water is coming into my room. And no more was heard from him. On the morning of the 26th, this was all that was left of the Sophia. And now the search begins for survivors. There were none. So this is a drawing, basically, of how the ship lays today. Um, She's in uh, 60 to 30 feet of water. She's rolled over on her port side. Her bow is somewhat upright. She's kind of split in the middle, and her boilers are out, and, uh, and she's, she's rolled over on her port side. So I'm going to ask you to kind of sit back and relax a little bit. Um, we, were on, we were actually on the ship today, did two dives on her. So um, come and enjoy this beautiful shipwreck.
So these are her boilers. Chuck, it's yours. <laughs> Presentation. 
Okay, so back to my segment. Um, Annette's told you the story. Um, she sort of ends her video with the notion that uh, you know, artifacts have been removed for the wreck over the years. So what I'm going to talk about is, is you know, what we can learn from them or what I have learned from them. Um, so early sport divers were probably diving there in the, in the 60s and the focus probably initially was on brass. That was the standard practice, port holes, steam pipes, anything that might make money. Uh, you know, you moved into sort of the phase probably in the 70s with souvenir hunting. And, uh, you know, I would probably say that the China was actually a later thing. You know, people picked up uh, stuff that maybe had value and, and then, then they started realizing that the China had logos on it and this was sort of cool and, and the stuff started coming out. So when I started working on this book, it was kind of a pet project. I found a couple of pieces of ship China under a dock and I wanted to learn more. And when I started investigating, I found nobody could tell me much about it. You know, I sent an email off to, well, it was back in the 90s, I sent a letter off to the <laughs> CPR archives and they gave me the page out of somebody else's book and said, well, here's what we know. And I went, well, that's nice. It's out of a railway China book doesn't really help me with the ship China. So I launched into a, what became about a seven or eight year project uh, to sort of look at ship China in general up and down the Pacific coast. So Mexico to Alaska, you know, what were the shipping lines using, what shipping lines had it, that sort of thing. And what I discovered is, you know, when I started looking at some of these uh, wrecks, uh, the Sophia stood out and, you know, uh, head and shoulders above just about anything else. Uh, and that is, I slowly accumulated 15 different patterns that divers had recovered. So my goal was to learn about what had been recovered, try to date it, try to make sense of, of why so many patterns. And so kind of that's what the story is that we're gonna follow now. But you know, those characters that recovered this stuff, um, one thing I'll say is, is most of them were quite happy to share the information that they provided. Uh, Two or three of them, I enlisted their help and sent them uh, instructions of what to do. So take a photo of the front and back, fill out this database, basically do my work. Uh, but what it, what it did is I was able to start to track uh, time periods for the China and, and dates for the China. So you look at all the patterns, but you sort of realize them, well, the patterns range from 1906 to basically 1918 and everywhere in between. So what we learned is amazing. So what has been recovered from this little vessel? So the principal pattern is a pattern called Tremblant. Um, I have no idea where that name came from. It's just universally used and no one, so that's what I used in the book. And it describes a pattern that has the CPR checkered house flag uh, garter logo, which was somewhat standard practice. It was used on a number of different uh, pieces of China, but in different uh, in it with different decorations. So what I learned from, I think about six or seven divers that had Sophia China was, was over 14 different shapes. So shapes are things like a plate is a shape, a cup is a shape, a creamer is a shape. So 14 different shapes were recovered. They often look like the picture in the lower left and cleaned up. They look at like the picture in the right hand side. So this was a principal pattern. It was issued, as I mentioned earlier, by CPR in 1910. It was used up actually until 1945 as their principal pattern on, on the ships. Then we discovered there was also a pattern that I've called VIP, Tremblant VIP, and that is CPR added a gold rim to the China for the captain's place setting. So if even today on a cruise ship, you sometimes can have dinner with the captain. There was a special occasion China for that. So that particular table got the VIP China. So it's distinguished by that gold uh, trim. And as you can see, not a lot of shapes. There may be more out there, but all I know of today are, are eight inch side plates and, and these uh, uh, four and a half inch saucers. But you've got a sub pattern. 
Then there's this pattern, which I call the Sophia. The greatest concentration of this rope logo has come from pieces from the Sophia. Again, there's different shapes represented. So creamers, chamber pots, uh, plates, oval platters. And the back stamp on it tells a story. So this particular company made this pattern for over a four year period. And I believe it was one batch because it's a fairly scarce rare pattern. So you sort of go, hmm, well, how does this figure into the standard pattern? There's less of it, um, looks similar, but it's from a later period. Another pattern is a pattern we call red stripe. And it came in nine inch plates and oval platters. That's what's been recovered. Now this is a quite a bit earlier pattern. This was introduced in 1906. So immediately you're going, why is this pattern on the Sophia when she didn't even show up till 1912? Wouldn't she have more modern China? So that becomes a bit of a mystery. Even more mysterious is there's VIP red stripe. So that addition of the gold uh, rim uh, set to the side of that would have been for the captain's place setting. Then we move on and we go, okay, green band crown China. Like what's the significance of this? Well, we actually know that this was the first pattern used in the Empress Hotel in Victoria. So that was a CPR hotel opened in 1908. This pattern dates 1910, 1912. What was he doing at Princess Sophia? Well, if we delve into the story a little more, the only shape that we find are soup plates. So those were nine inch shallow uh, bowls, right? And they were a kind of a British product. So what you might've found on a, on a uh, uh, you know, something like an Alaska steamship, the soup plate would be more like a, a deep bowl about six inches. But we've also found this pattern in other dock sites around the coast. So again, you know, what was it doing on board? And we'll try to answer some of these questions. Another pattern, this is called green band interscroll. So the, the letters that you see say Canadian Pacific Railway or CPR, so that's what's in the interscroll. Only six inch vegetable dishes. So they're little oval dishes and there's an example up front here. Again, one shape, different, completely different pattern. What's going on? Well, and then we have green band with no interscroll. And again, you can see some of the different shapes, um, you know, things like the Shire egg dishes, and again, the six inch ovals. Um, we move on. So now we have another pattern called Newport. Now this is a stock pattern that was often used in hotels, but it's in, you know, you can see here, there's five different shapes recovered. So it's getting pretty confusing and you can certainly imagine when I was starting to get this information, I'm going like, what are these guys telling me? Is this stuff from the right wreck? Is it? No, it all, it's all verified. It all came from the Princess Sophia. And again, another pattern. This is quite, CPR used this one called Colonial quite a bit, again, in mostly hotels. And as far as I know, the only shape in Colonial has been saucers. There may be other shapes out there. We move on, Savoy, again, hotel pattern. Uh, it was found, one of the most common items in this pattern was the ice cream shells. Okay, and there's some of these eight inch plates, but the ice cream shells seem to be the thing that stood out the most. Then we had green stripe wear, which anybody familiar with the logging industry, mining industry, canneries, this was a stock pattern that was used in all those sort of things. Well, so hang on, we've got VIP wear, we've got standard Tremblant, and now we're getting down to, you know, green stripe wear used in logging camps. Anyways, it's, it's getting a bit confusing. And then let's throw another one in the mix, green and red stripe wear. So again, certain limited shapes were, were found. And then we're really getting down to the bottom, white wear. So this is like no markings, very plain, uh, primarily coffee cups is, is what came up. And then there's some anomalies, a single egg cup. And this pattern is called Alton. 
and is most normally associated with the wreck of the Empress of Ireland on the Atlantic coast. What was it doing on the Princess Sophia? Produced in 1906. One egg count. That one I can't explain. However, let's try to dissect what was going on. Why? So upon commissioning, she would have had that standard Tremblant pattern. That was the mainstay of the day. It would have included a limited amount of VIP wear for the captain's table, for dining, you know, for uh, visiting dignitaries or people around his table. What I think started to happen is they introduced what I call the Sophia pattern, the rope logo pattern in 1914. And I think they were trying a little different uh, twist and that was slowly introduced to the ship as well as some other ships as well. It wasn't exclusive to the Sophia, but given the quantity that's come off of it, I gave it that name. When you start getting to this green stripe wear and the red and green stripe wear and the white wear, that was stock patterns for the crew. Okay, so they didn't get the same luxury as, as the guests. You know, they dined in the lower decks and they dined on plain china. So my theory is you have to realize, and part of the reason she's kind of the forgotten Titanic of the, of the Pacific coast is she sank you know, during World War I. But World War I also affected the vitulating department, okay, the department that would supply the vessel. You weren't getting top mark China from Britain uh, when they're sinking your ships, right? And it certainly wasn't a prior priority during the war effort. So what my theory is, all the CPR ships docked in front of the Empress Hotel in Victoria, if you ever see any of the, the historic photos. Well, it's not far to go to the, the, you know, the storage facility at the Empress and say, you know, I'm out of soup plates, okay? We can give you a bunch of Empress Hotel soup plates, hence one pattern, soup plates. Yep, we're out of ice cream shells. All the Tremblant ice cream shells are broken or, or pretty much missing. Oh, huh, we can help you there. How about Newport? Yeah, that'll do. The little oval vegetable dishes. Yep, we're out of those. Okay, we've got some green band hotel wear. Take that. So you can sort of start to explain why this mishmash was occurring on the vessel. So we then move on to the few things that we can explain. So I have no idea why they have the red stripe wear on the Princess Sophia. That's a very early pattern. It, it would have been running out at the time that she, uh, at the, the time she was even commissioned. So my only thought there is they were running low on those shapes as well. So maybe demi cups and saucers, which is what they find. Maybe the oval platters, don't know. And then when it comes to the Alton pattern, I, I, I'm at a loss, you know, one egg cup. <laughs> Uh, which is primarily an East Coast pattern. But you can sort of see, um, there's, there's, there is a story there. So in addition to the China, divers have also found and recovered cutlery glassware and hollowware. And I haven't spent a lot of time studying that. I can tell you that they all will have a round garter. So more modern stuff has an oval garter um, or it will have the CPR script. Now, we come to the sort of sticky part. The museum asked me to speak a little bit about shipwrecks and the law. So um, I'm gonna keep it short. So basically the state of Alaska, uh, any historic objects are protected by the state, uh, whether they're underwater or on land. Um, they lay claim to it. So essentially they exert ownership. Um, I certainly do know of cases in Alaska where people have contested that. Well, the solution is you go to court duke it out. Um, and sometimes you, it's in your favor and sometimes it's not. Um, but when you go to court, it costs money. So essentially it's unlawful to remove artifacts from the shipwrecks um, unless you get a permit. So if you have a valid reason, you're doing research, you're uh, documenting things, uh, there may be even a case for, for you know, important artifacts that, that could be pilfered that are of, of importance to the state. Uh, you have to state your case and you have to get a permit to recover. I've attached, uh, identified a couple of sources if people want to read more. Uh, Dave McMahon, who was previously the uh, 
one of the state archaeologists. He wrote a good paper on explaining it and, and how it works. So uh, some thank yous. Um, you know, the presentation wouldn't be possible without you know, resources from the museums, uh, archives, and individuals. And so that's what this photograph's about. And with that, if we want to bring up the lights and people have questions, um, we have a few examples of the patterns that uh, are from the Princess Sophia. These are not from the Princess Sophia. They're patterns representative of uh, what you saw on the various slides. So if you want to, people like to touch and feel, you can come up, just don't break them or Annette will be mad at me. <laughs> okay, so open to questions. Uh, Yes. Okay. So the question was, if it's illegal to remove uh, things from the wreck, but you find items elsewhere, for example, the downtown docks, the old steamship docks, what are the rules on that? That's fair game. And I take advantage of that fair game a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? More questions? I, I got one. Yes. Um, can you talk about the, the passengers a little bit? Like who they, you know, I've heard that there were quite a few uh, captains of, uh, yes. like those stern wheelers and stuff yes. at UConn. And, a lot of the people were from Dawson. Dawson lost about 10% of its population. I think it's about 10%. Um, they were, um, oh, the question was to talk a little bit about the people that were on the ship. Um, so Dawson, the community of Dawson lost, they, they, had, they suffered the largest loss. Um, there were captains and crews from Stern, the Stern Wheelers. This was the last trip out, the last ship leaving Skagway for the winter. So all of the maritime individuals that were heading south going home were on board, which created a lot of problems actually the next year because there weren't captains and crews to, to man the ships. Um, there was, um, well, what's his name, the climb Mount Everest. I mean, not Mount Everest, Mount Denali. Uh, yes, Mr. Harper and his wife. Um, there were, um, well, John Pugh that I mentioned, who's not related customs. at all to our John Pugh, but um, he was a customs individual. He was from Juneau. Um, there, were, there was a wide variety of, of folks, yeah. miners, some of them very wealthy miners coming in. Yes, sir. I understand. And I think somebody over here had a question too, so I'm gonna, I'll grab, I'll grab you next. I understand there were sto stowaways aboard. There are, there were rumors. So he asked, he said he understands that there were stowaways. And there are rumors of stowaways, and I've read about stowaways. Um, and the best I can tell is there may be six, um, but there's no documentation. I don't know about you. I didn't find any newspaper articles or anything that said, has anybody seen my brother, son, husband, or whatever. I'll get you next, but you? I used to dive a lot, and I was just interested, what kind of fish are those? I would never see, well, you wouldn't see very many fish down there when I would dive, so I was wondering what all those fish were. The Safaya is an incredible home for a wide variety of life. Most of what you saw there around the bow are what we call the black sea bass. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the most, for me, the most fascinating fish on that wreck is the prow fish. And those are fish that normally live a thousand feet deep, um, and they have they have these beautiful uh, fluorescent spots on their gill plates. They're in this really blunt face and these bug eyes, and they're huge, and I just love them. But uh, you know, we find wolf eels on there. We find octopus, all kinds of all kinds of fish. Um, and if you're thinking about going and fishing the Sophia for some of those black sea bass, keep in mind that my boat's fishing tackle is stocked from your fishing on that rack. <laughs> so you had a question. You made me think about diving. What's the water temperature out there? 
It was 42 degrees today. We were on the, uh, the Sophia today. And is the current for, does the current force you to go about a stern? Or just no. We, we drop in um, about midship, right about our boilers. And generally, the first dive, you do the deepest. So we go in at the boilers and go down to the stern, um, if you're so inclined. I, I didn't go to the stern today but, or yesterday, but um, you can. And then on your second dive, you dive the bow, which is much shallower. Yes, sir? I believe, oh, yes, the microphone's on. Um, the Princess Sophia, 1918 October, steel hull, fairly shallow. Can you compare the condition of this wreck to Titanic iron hull, much, much deeper, six years earlier, and the state of those two vessels right now? Well, they're both cracked up. <laughs> uh, Titanic would be in better condition. Yes. Yeah. This is not the air. Yeah, the Sophia, you have to realize, is kind of in a zone where it's influenced a little bit by the surface environment mm -hmm. and a uh, little bit of current and a uh, much smaller vessel, um, structurally probably a little different. Um, she's over on her side. That little drawing that we showed earlier gives you a sense. She's pretty much right on her, or on her port side. Collapsed. And she's collapsing yeah. in. So she's, she's collapsing in on herself. So the way now. ships break down, especially, well, doesn't matter if they're upright or not, is, is they break off at the turn of the build. So where, where the base of the vessel starts to connect to the sidewalls, they typically break off there. So you can imagine she's over like this. So all that top side is all caving down, right? So, so when you swim along her, and this is my first experience, is, you know, you're kind of looking at deck plating it just weaves and bobs. Um, one of the things that I was curious about is and why I came up here is I said to Annette, I see lots of pictures of this vessel, but kind of a navigational archeologist, one of my things is trying to get a, a feel for what it looks like and how it's laid out and, and how it's breaking down. And so what I learned with this one is, yeah, it's over on its side and now it's kind of starting to pancake. The side walls are dropping down uh, on the material be below it, right? So you get this kind of just flat plane and then on the lower side there's a debris field of everything that's spilled out the other thing is she had a wooden all her cabins and that on the above the main deck were wood so they rotted out long time ago and are gone um, but you know the boilers are solid as mm -hmm. they they were built um, might throw that in the whole notion yeah. of all the books talk about this mm -hmm. catastrophic explosion none of the three boilers that show any evidence of ever exploding right they're as solid as the day went down. So if a boiler explodes, you expect kind of like a bomb going off. You know, it would, it would blow the sides out and stuff. And none of that's evident. So I don't know if the fires were still stoked or, you know, whether it's folklore, but the evidence in the bottom doesn't, doesn't support the whole notion of it blowing up, right? What we do know about the ship, uh, um, the Titanic, what we know about the Titanic is she hit an iceberg and she sank, she split in half, bow one half, stern one half and and went down and the parts are i think they're like Over half a mile, mile yeah. apart or a mile apart sophia didn't sink like that sophia was um thrown across vanderbilt reef i don't know if you've ever been there it's a big kind of craggly mountaintop that comes out of the middle of the ocean between inland canal so she hit coming from skagway towards juno so she was traveling south and she hit the reef full, full steam, um, and that's where she sat. But that is not where she is now. She is on the south end of the reef, kind of facing north, um, east a little bit. So she, somewhere in, in that dark, those last, the final hours, was, was ripped across that reef and turned around and went down. What's, what's a bit ironic is in the historic photographs, you'll see a marker buoy. Mm -hmm. So the marker buoy that was to, to mark the wreath that was to protect her from going on the reef, and she actually sank virtually on that site. Yeah. So when you were down there and we're looking back and we're saying, well, here's where these photos were taken. The marker was right there, and the ship is like right there. So yeah, she spun on the reef and ended up 
stern stern south what's south, what, north what's interesting about um you know people go well geez you know there's a marker buoy how come they didn't see it navigation back in 1918 is really different than it is today i run boats today let me tell you i have every electronic possible i have a gps i have a radar i have um, depth sounders i have all of this information and then I also have it on my iPhone and my iPad in case all the stuff on the boats break, <laughs> breaks down. But that is not what they had in those days. They were traveling in a blinding snowstorm, whiteout conditions, high winds, and the only way they had to navigate was by compass and by blowing a horn and listening for the echo from the side of the mountains. I'm an electronics girl. I like lots of tools, believe me. I am not the mariner they were in those days. But it's pretty amazing when you think about that, the amount of travel that occurred in these waters. And we all know how treacherous the waters here are. They're, they are just not waters to be trifled with. And, and yet they, all of these ships plied these waters with very little. Um, Losses. Yeah. Very few, actually. Yeah. Yes, and then, yes, so you're two, you're one. So, so in that uh, blinding snowstorm, dark, why was the ship traveling at such high speed? Well, high speed is relative. It was, okay, so she wanted to know why the Sophia was traveling at such a, at full steam um, in the dark in a blinding snowstorm. You know, nobody survived that wreck, and they actually have never found the captain. Um, so nobody really knows. But my guess is going to be she left the dock four hours late. And she had a time to make up. And this is an experienced captain who's been in these waters, an experienced crew. You know? Yes? You know, Annette, you have dived on this boat mm -hmm. a lot. You know the history. What does it feel like emotionally on this wreck? Well, I'll tell you, my first dive on the Sophia was uh, several years ago, and I was, um, it's not a dive for brand spanking new diver. You don't want to be out there on your third dive. Um, so I probably had 100 dives under my belt when I did my first dive on her. There's a lot of, there's current out there. Uh, the visibility can be nothing, although today it was 60 feet. It was pretty awesome. Um, <clears throat> But when I, my first dive on her, I went down, her bow is kind of upright and it goes like this, shaped like that. And, the, and it's lined with these big plumous anemones. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen them, but they're these anemones that will stretch up. And they'll be for, some of them will get to five feet tall if they stretch full the way out, with heads like this, white heads like this. And they're white and they're beautiful, beautiful anemones. So the first dive I went on her, um, I, the visibility was fairly low. So from the bow rail to the bow rail was, if I was in the middle, was just right at the side of my ability to see. And um, of course I was nervous and excited and all of that kind of stuff and went down and I knew a little bit about her story. I knew that everybody died and I, dove a few wrecks before, and I know that all ships carry the hopes and dreams of the people that were in them. I know that. Um, so as I started swimming up the bow, I could see these big, tall, ghostly figures. <laughs> and I just kept swimming, and they were all lined right along the bow. And for me, that was when I fell in love with this wreck, because I felt those ghosts of that wreck saying it was okay for me to be here. And I still feel that today when I'm down there. It's, it's an amazing emotional experience for me. More questions? Yes. You know, there are, I, I've said a lot of times that I don't personally and I'm only speaking personally. So the question was, is there a story about the dog that survived? I personally do not believe a dog survived that wreck. 
That's my personal belief. And the reason that's my personal belief is every shipwreck along the coast of these waters has had a dog survive. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at Lynn Canal and you look at Vanderbilt Reef and you look at where she's placed and you think about 50 knot winds and high seas, um, the chance of survival is pretty the tiny, in my humble opinion, Jock, you might have a different opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, <laughs> but I would, I would, I did come across one account of it. It looked like the second officer may have made it to shore in one of the lifeboats and then succumbed to hypothermia because there's nobody to to rescue him. Right. So you're in a snowstorm. You're soaking wet. You're covered in oil. And even if you got in that lifeboat and managed to get to shore. There's nobody around to, to save you, right? And you're not going to last probably more than an hour or two with soaking wet clothes in what what would the temperature be in a snowstorm? Zero, right? So that would be Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have this discussion. <laughs> we do. <laughs> yes, sir. And I see you right in front of him, so I'll yeah, grab you next. In 1918, 1919, they recovered the safe, and I don't remember how much gold was in it, but there was quite a bit of gold in it. Yeah, she was carrying a fair amount of money. And they recovered actually quite a few bodies, that, people that were still in their staterooms. Um, yeah, CPR was heavily criticized because their first priority was the safe. <laughs> and in fact, um, you know, and the divers even knew that there, there was a number of people in staterooms and floating in, in, in the common rooms. And the other thing is, what was quite interesting is, is the one account talks about a number of people with life jackets on in that observation room on the main deck. So it was as if they were getting ready, you know, to abandon ship. And I think based on those telegraph messages, it was catastrophic. She was one minute on the rock, solid. You know, it was high tide, mm -hmm. and I think the whim, wind caught her, spun her around, double bottom or not. If you read uh, Locke's, one of his final messages, at one, at one o'clock, he'd already said the bottom's damaged, so it wasn't going to take a lot to, to tear a hole in it. And, you know, just personally, it's my fourth time on the wreck today, uh, but I walked around on Vanderbilt Reef, and if you walk around that, I had always had the impression it was a rounded glacial reef. This thing is like a bunch of jagged, you know, spikes. I mean, it doesn't matter that she had a double bottom. You know, it would have just torn that half inch, three quarter inch steel like nothing. So one one thing we we know pretty much for sure is the last messages were around 5:40 in the evening, mm -hmm. and most of the people's watches were stopped at six. I yeah, can't remember somewhere. All, somewhere after 6 p.m. Um, so it was very fast. It had to have been horrifying. Um, her power went out. It was dark. All the rescue ships that had yeah. been standing by had gone because the weather was so bad they could not stand by the Safai anymore. So they had gone and anchored up behind Sentinel Island. So she was left there all alone in the dark with all of that noise of that ship grinding on the reef. You can imagine how horrifying it must have been for all those individuals. Well, and you have to remember the Cedar raced out mm -hmm. when she got the message yeah. and she couldn't even find Vanderbilt Reef because yeah. of the snowstorm. So that's a bit scary. You know, another 200 foot ship running around in, in the darkness in the snowstorm trying to find survivors. And then, you know, finally she just decided this is crazy. You know, we're going to go down as well. So, <coughs> more questions? Yeah, I got it. Yes, sir. I got two, actually. One is, can you tell what the status of the anchors were on the ship by diving on it? And they're gone. Were they out? The they're anchor? gone. <laughs> they're gone, and there's no chain out, as, as best I could right. see. So there's no indication they put out an anchor to try to stabilize the ship? or No. no I think in the pictures, you'll see they, they never, ever dropped them, because their assumption was he's going to back off in the next high tide. And, and then, she'd been on reefs before and backed off. Yeah. This was not her first grounding. Well, I just figure if you're flipping around, if you drop your anchor, you might stabilize yourself. I don't think they knew they were going to flip around. It was right. probably too late. 
The other question is on the flatware. I have been involved with ship decommissionings mm -hmm. before, and you would remove all that sort of stuff off of a ship. So if the Canadian Pacific Line had a bunch of shipware coming off of one of the vessels that they were either selling right. or whatever, any indications mm -hmm. that they had some sort of place where they would take all the dinnerware, and that would explain why you had so much different dinnerware? Well, I mean, they had vitulating departments. They had warehouses. Um, you know, what I was trying to explain is is where the headquarters was. That's where the Empress Hotel was, and that explains kind of some of, some of the hotel patterns. Uh, when CPR decommissioned stuff, they usually threw it away. Or what you'll find is a pattern that we don't have represent here because it's a much later pattern called the Empress pattern. So if you're riding something like the Princess Patricia in the 70s, um, it's a bird of paradise. It's got... Um, and the Kathleen had it. Yeah, and the Kathleen had it as well. And that china you'll find on the open market and the back stamp is scratched off. So, the so CPR, if they took a ship out of service, they would just get rid of all the china that was on Oh, it would probably be transferred, anything useful. But anything worn, anything worn would, would be getting rid of. Like, you didn't find... It's interesting you'd study that too from the China department. Like if I look at our little union steamship company, anything you find is completely beat. You know, they were like hand to mouth operation, right? CPR was a big multinational, international company, right? Ships, planes, trains, hotels. And uh, if, if things got chipped, over it went. Things got cracked, over it went, right? If it was worn out, over it went. And, uh, you know, there's a story in, in my neck of the woods that, you know, something where the current BC ferries run that, you know, there's probably a trail of China across the ocean <laughs> floor, um, you know, stuff going overboard, right? But that being said, I also hear stories of, oh, yeah, the steward was too lazy to wash it, so it all went out the porthole at the dock. And I said, you know, in all my dock dive, I never found this treasure trove of good China sitting there, right? It's always chipped, cracked, or broken. Well, we do pretty good here. Yeah, you do well. We do. Uh, we, I, we dive the docks here. It's a muddy, dirty, nasty, gnarly dive. But um, I've got a lot of um, we, good China. <laughs> You can't microwave it, so if you find a coffee cup, let me tell you, they did not have microwaves in those days, no. and I tried microwaving because I thought, oh, cool, I'll just have, you know, my tea in the morning. Doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? If not, you're welcome Thanks. to come up and kind of get a sense of what they would use.